Is the dog still barking in the background? I think she stopped. Hi guys! For Pride Month, I decided to compile a list of recommendations for LGBTQ media that has good representation and LGBTQ public figures that are good role models. The first half will be my picks, while the second half will be from my subscribers' recommendations. I also have to give some disclaimers before I begin because people's comfort media as well as husbandos and waifus can be touchy subjects. Number one, my choices will skew based on my perspective, which is informed by my experiences being a cis bisexual woman who prefers women. This means that a lot of my recommendations will be lesbian or bisexual female content. Number two, I'm not saying any media recommended is overall a flawless piece of media, for example with artistic value, writing, production, etc. Nor am I saying it's a perfect example of representation, only that it was enjoyable and good in many aspects in my perspective. Hindsight is 2020. what is good media or good representation changes over time. What we would have considered a good piece of media or good representation 10 years ago may be questionable today. Number three, I can't guarantee that the creators of the media, characters or real public figures aren't wholly unproblematic and have never been involved in controversy. One writer on that one show that had good representation may have made some really off-colour comments. I can't guarantee that that hasn't happened. I also can't guarantee that the creators of the media, characters or real life public figures will never be controversial. On so many recommendation lists I see comments like, well that aged well, as if we can see into the future. We don't know what will happen and therefore if somebody comes back five years in the future to this video and says, well that person actually did and said this, well it's like I didn't know that would happen. Now for this section I will be talking about anime anime and manga. Yaoi and Yuri are both genres that revolve around relationships between men, which is Yaoi, and women, which is Yuri. I do have a video on Yaoi, Yuri, and the LGBT community, and how Yaoi has been criticised for having quite harmful themes and tropes, which is why there won't be many Yaoi recommendations in this section. Yuri, on the other hand, has not been subject to the same criticisms. If you want the full context, I'll link that video in the description. But let's start with Strawberry Panic. The story is set on St. Astria Hill, a very large hilltop where three affiliated schools of St. Meata, Spica and Lulim are located. Our story centres around a new transfer student Nagisa as she navigates her school and relationships with other students. This is a very special show because there are no male characters. If you ever just want a break from men, just watch this show. There are none whatsoever. It's honestly magical and everything 14 year old me could have ever wanted. In case you're wondering, I rank the uniforms as Lu Lim having the best uniform, closely followed by Spica. I cosplayed a Mieta student before at a Comic Con and a girl came up to me and was super excited because she'd never seen anybody cosplay from Story Panic before. And we looked at each other in mutual appreciation and knowledge that we were pretty gay. The next on my list is Kashi Mashi Girl Meets Girl, which was actually my first ever Yuri, and I'm gonna tell you what the premise is, and you're gonna have to stick with me for a moment, okay? A boy called Hazama finally has the courage to confess his feelings to his crush, Yasuna, but she rejects him. Upon a walk on a mountain cliff, he is struck down dead by an alien spacecraft, and they can bring him back to life, but only as a girl. As weird as it sounds, it's actually a really good anime, and it's quite wholesome and cute. I do have one nitpick. Hazumu didn't choose to transition into a girl. She was forced to. So I think some of the adjustments being made could have been shown to be more of a struggle for her and shown some representation of gender dysphoria. But I get it, it wasn't the focus of the story. Hizumu becoming a girl was only really a plot device to carry the rest of the plot off. The next is Sasameki Koto, Whispered Words. Murasami Sumika is popular in the high school for her excellence in the marks and sports. However, she is a secret. She is in love with her classmate Kazama Yushio. Yushio also has a liking to girls, but she hasn't noticed Sumika's feelings and has always been refused by other girls. 
It's a really sweet story again, I don't want to spoil too much of it by going into the plot of these stories, but just know they're all wholesome and cute. Tianguan Sifu, Heaven's Official Blessing 800 years ago, Xi Lan was the crown prince of the Xianli Kingdom, one who was beloved by his citizens and the darling of the world. Unsurprisingly, he ascended to the heavens at a very young age. Now, 800 years later, Xian Lian ascends to the heavens for a third time as the laughing stock of all three realms. On his first task as a god, he meets a mysterious demon who rules the ghosts and terrifies the heavens. Yet, unbeknownst to Xie Lian, this demon king has been paying attention to him for a very, very long time. This is a Donghua, a Chinese anime adapted from a Chinese webcomic and is a breakthrough for LGBT representation in Chinese media. Please definitely check out the webcomics as well as the physical copies of the comics and the Donghua because the more support it gets, the more representation we can get from China in the future gonna have to apologize for the pronunciation of this next character because I go French every time I say it and I don't know why. Hanje Zoe. Hanje. Why am I saying Hanje? I know it's Hanji, but for some reason I always want to say Hanje. Let's just go with Zoe. In the Attack on Titan manga, they're never referred to as male or female and their gender is somewhat ambiguous. The author Isayama has stated that it's up to the reader's interpretation whether they're a man, woman, or non-binary. Although anime and live-action adaptations have gendered Zoe as being female, using female actors, and using she-her pronouns. Grail from Black Butler is implied to be male to female transgender. While she is drawn with a male body and has male voice actors, she makes references to being uncomfortable in her body and also uses she her pronouns. Some fans have argued that just because Grell is flamboyant it doesn't make them transgender and that other characters refer to them as he him. In my opinion, there's only so many times a character who was assigned male at birth can refer to themselves as a lady until it's apparent something is being implied. And how can I not mention Bubbleine? Bubbleine is pure, sweet, and it was there from the start. No, Bubbleine wasn't queer baiting. If you don't know what queer baiting is, it's when creators of a media hint and suggest that something may happen between two characters of the same sex and never go through with it. And they only did it to begin with to gauge the interest of a queer audience. But Bubbleine is canon, y'all! I can't believe I just said y'all, but it's canon, y'all! The only reason that Bubbleine was only brought up towards the end of the show and became canon at the end of the show is because of censorship from networks. There was no malicious intent from the creators to never give us Bubbleine. The intention was always there. Come on, Bubblegum's most prized possession was a t-shirt that Marceline gave to her and when she gets it back she sniffs it. And she has a picture of the two of them taped on the inside of her closet. Symbolism. Marceline has a whole last song about wanting to apologise and reconcile with Bubblegum after some kind of breakup between them. It was there, don't tell me it wasn't there. Cosima, Orphan Black. Now there are some criticisms when it comes to Orphan Black and representation, and I'll get this out the way to begin with. Orphan Black is a series that revolves around Sarah Manning, a woman who discovers that she is one of many clones, one of which being a lesbian, Cosima, and another one being a transgender man. The problem with this is that because they're all genetically identical and only some of them are LGBT, it implies that being gay or transgender is a part of nurture rather than nature, that they aren't born like that. However, for representation to happen within the main cast and the main actress, they, they have to be clones and played by the same actress. It's just how it works. It wasn't meant to be malicious and I don't think people should read into it too much. I really love Cosima so much and one of the lines that she has in the show has really stuck with me. 
when another character says to her that it's interesting that she is a lesbian, whereas her sisters, her clones, aren't, she reply, my sexuality is not the most interesting thing about me. And I really enjoyed that because she isn't just a character there to be gay. She is a fully developed character with interests and personality traits. And I love that. I love seeing a fully developed character that isn't there just to be the token gay. Moving on, Pusse Washington from Orange is the New Black, and I love Pusse. She's such a wholesome presence and she breaks so many stereotypes. In fact, there's an episode where she is really hurt because stereotypes are applied to her, that because she's black she must be uneducated and that she must come from a terrible background. And this isn't true, she's well-travelled, she knows several different languages, and she enjoys reading. There are so many different things that are in Pousse that you just don't see in any other black and queer character. Let's talk about another prison show, Wentworth. I really enjoy Wentworth, I think a lot more people should watch it, and they have a wide range of characters. And this involves both of sexuality and race. One of the leading actors, Sharina Clanton, is both of Aboriginal Australian and Native American descent. Another main actor, Robbie Magasiva, is of Samoan descent. Star actress Danielle Cormack has said that she doesn't like to label her sexuality and is interested in both men and women. Danielle Alexis is the first transgender woman to feature on a Foxtel slash Netflix show, which is Wentworth. There was some controversy about the decision to cast a cis man as a transgender woman, Maxine, but I'm not exactly sure why that decision was made. The show absolutely does not hold back from displaying any transphobia that Maxine faces, and perhaps it would have been really uncomfortable for a transgender person to be put in that situation, but then again, transgender actors are actors and can be professional in those roles and hold their own. No disrespect to the actor, he's great in the role and from what I can see from the trans community, they really enjoy Maxine and have positively received the character. I just also feel it was a missed opportunity to give a trans actress the role. Heartstopper. I've watched the show but I haven't read the webcomic and I'm not quite sure why because it was out around the time that I was reading LGBT webcomics. It must have just gone over my radar or something. In particular, I really like the character of Elle because when it comes to Elle and her gender identity, the audience aren't talked down to. They aren't told explicitly, Elle is trans, oh my god, trans, trans. Elle is allowed to be a character in her own right and have her own interests and beliefs. The audience are instead given cues to infer that Elle is trans. For one, Tao refers to one of the teachers as being transphobic and also mentions Elle and the fact that Elle used to attend an all boys school. And she also talks about the discomfort of going back to that school for a visit because of what happened there. It's incredibly subtle, but I really enjoyed it because it let me get to know Elle first as a character and as a person, as somebody with thoughts, feelings, beliefs. I liked that. It's so cleverly done that halfway through the show I had to Google as to whether or not Elle was a trans character, even though I should have known that because she used to go to an all-boys school and therefore had to be transferred because she came out and transitioned and there was a lot of transphobia in the school. It really flips a lot of LGBT representation on its head because a lot of the time when it comes to these characters, the first thing you know about them is their explicit label. It's really lazy writing because the queer audience are told that you have to care about this character purely because they are also LGBT or queer. Ellie, The Last of Us, and I'm specifically going to be talking about the DLC to the original The Last of Us game. It's really pure and wholesome. It's two young teenagers being friends and then realizing their feelings for each other, but it's bittersweet because just after that, tragedy strikes. It gives those feelings of a first love and realizing who you are deep down inside. Oh, it gets me. Maya, Borderlands 2. Maya is canonically asexual. She's shown really not to enjoy it when Moxie flirts with her. 
However, she isn't a romantic and can feel romantic attraction, but confesses that she doesn't know much about romance. The Fallout series. In the first ever Fallout game, female characters could flirt with female NPCs, as could male characters flirt with male NPCs, and in the sequel, they brought same-sex marriage. It was actually a pioneer of LGBT representation. Not many games could allow males to romance other males in games and females as well, and it was also the first game to allow same-sex marriage. It would take The Sims another 10 years before they allowed the exact same thing. So what's up with that EA? Let's talk about some public figures. And first up we have Jin Xing. Jin Xing is a Chinese ballerina, modern dancer, choreographer, actress, founder and artistic director of the contemporary dance company Shanghai. She is a transgender celebrity. She has been there, she has done that, she has got the t-shirt. She is more successful than I could ever hope to be, God bless her. Oh, also she has three adopted children that she raised by herself until her marriage in 2005. Oh, also, in addition to native Chinese, she can speak English, Korean, Japanese, Italian, and French. If you can be like anybody in the world, be Jin Xing. Like, amazing. Role model. She also publicly criticized Vladimir Putin until the post was taken down by Chinese censors. Incredible. Xia Tao is a Chinese activist, actress, filmmaker, artist, and gay icon. She has been active in the Chinese gay scene since the 1990s and was the first lesbian to come out on Chinese television. Iconic. Tia Tia is the first openly lesbian artist in China. She released her first single, Ai Bu Fan, Love Does Not Discriminate in 2006. The government has made no effort to suppress the song. They know that it's fire. Zhou Dan is a lawyer, scholar and activist. He is a leading voice for the rights of gay and lesbian people in mainland China. He also fights for the rights of people living with or affected by HIV AIDS by advocating human rights based on the approach to the epidemic. In April 2003, he founded the Shanghai Hotline for Sexual Minorities. Dodi. Dodi is a YouTuber with over 2 million subscribers known for being a singer-songwriter and I think she's a great role model for queer youth. In many of her romance songs, she explores the theme of sexuality and she writes about her experiences of being attracted to girl. She also delves into problems that she has with self-worth and mental health within her music. Overall, she's generally an unproblematic human being, she doesn't really get involved in any drama or controversies, and therefore, again, I think she's a really good role model and is a generally positive presence in the LGBT community. Lin Gunn, lead singer of Paris. It's really refreshing and interesting to see LGBT representation in music, particularly when it comes to alternative rock. Lynn has been a prominent LGBT voice within the alternative music scene. She was one of several artists invited by GLAAD and Billboard to talk about her coming out story for National Coming Out Day in 2017. Lynn explained her decision to be vocal about her sexuality in an interview with Newsbeat in 2015. I have never had somebody to look up to and be like, oh, that person is okay and they're gay. If I can be that for someone, then that's why I'm open about it. This next section of the video are suggestions my subscribers have suggested, and some of them are things that I have already known about but haven't particularly delved into myself, and I won't be going into too much detail based on the fact that I might not know all of what they're talking about because I haven't experienced it, but also because I don't want to spoil things. One of these things is Iron Widow by Shiran J. Jiao. I do have the book, but I'm kind of scared to open it and read it because it's the hardcover version and it's so beautiful and I don't want to mess up the pages. Also, I haven't had time to properly sit down and dedicate my attention to reading a book. The young adult novel is a mecha reimagining on the rise of the Chinese Empress Wu Zetian, set in the nation of Huaxia, a futuristic reinterpretation of medieval China. It has LGBT and polyamorous elements to the story, which is something we don't get to see a lot in young adult fiction. The Owl House. 
It centers around the story of Luz Nocida, who is a Dominican-American human girl who accidentally stumbles into the human realm. She befriends a rebellious witch, Edith Clawthorn, also known as the Owl Lady. Although Luz does not have any magical abilities, she still dreams of becoming a witch and serves as Edith's apprentice at the Owl House. The Owl House became the first Disney property to feature a same-sex couple in leading roles, as well as the first Disney animated show to feature a same-sex kiss involving lead characters. The anime Stars Align revolves around Toma and his summer challenge is to save his tennis team, but he needs to recruit Maki's talent to the court. Within this anime, there is a non-binary character known as Yu. The Dragon Prince. This is something I've also watched myself and there's a ton of representation when it comes to race and skin tone, as well as this ability. Amaya is deaf and has to sign and the creators of the show talk to many deaf or hard of hearing people to understand how they communicate better, which is great. She's also unofficially confirmed to be a lesbian. She's very flirty with Janna, who is also unofficially confirmed to be a lesbian. There is also Runan and Ithari being a married couple, and also Annika and Niha, which are Queen Anya's parents. Gone Home. I also know this, I haven't played it myself, but I've watched other people do playthroughs, because that's how I do a lot of my gaming content when my laptop can't handle a really simple game like Gone Home. It's a walking puzzle simulator based on the premise that you arrive home and your mother, father and sister aren't there and you have to figure out what happened. I don't want to spoil it, but you just have to know that it is wholesome. Dragon Age Inquisition. Now there's a ton of LGBT representation in Dragon Age, there are romanceable LGB characters and also trans characters. <sighs> that was a lot of gay stuff I just talked about. And if you're wondering, hang on a minute, what about this piece of representation? What about this person? Why haven't you mentioned them? I couldn't fit everything I wanted to talk about in this video, just like I couldn't fit all of the suggestions I was given in the comments and in the DMs. So if you have any other suggestions when it comes to media or generally good role models, feel free to comment down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you all are having a happy and safe Pride Month and I will see you in the next video.